6%. That is a number that you need to know this morning. I'm Portia Collins, and this is Grounded. Uh-oh, starting with numbers on a Monday morning. That's a little <laughs> bit of a stretch for me. I'm Aaron Davis, and we are here every Monday with a singular mission. We want to give you hope and perspective. And that means that often we have to share the bad news before we get to the good stuff. So here's that bad news. 66% of American young adults, now this isn't necessarily reflective of the world, but 66% of American young adults who were regular church attenders in their teen years drop out of the church between the ages of 18 and 22. 18 and 22. I cannot imagine. Well, I know. Actually, it makes I my can. stomach hurt. It does. I can imagine because when I think about my wayward years, mm. 18 and 2020, 20, 20, both of us want to say 2022. Say <laughs> <laughs> but 18 and 22 was the years where. because you boomeranged you didn't yes, stay out of the I church did. I did I did yeah. so yeah I can't imagine I can't imagine well I know you come to ground it so that we can fill your tank but I'm gonna give you some homework this morning all right, all right? teacher P let's uh, take you it. know I'm ready I'm ready <laughs> I want you to write down the names of five young people who mm. you went to church with or you go to church with now um, you can write down, write them down on a piece of paper, or you can think of them, you know, in your mind. But I want you to give five people, okay? You can even put these in the chat if you feel comfortable. These names in the chat, mm. and do it now. Aaron, do you got names? Anything? This anybody is easy for mind? me because every day I drive the boy mobile. That's our big van to the middle school, and I pick up my sons, Eli and Noble, one a teenager, one just a few months shy of that teenage mm -hmm. birthday. So there's two. But I also pick up Lily, who's an eighth grader, Landry, who's a sixth grader, Brock, who's another sixth grader. So in my vehicle every single day, I got five young people that I don't ever want to see them walk away from Jesus. I pray for them as we yeah. go. They don't know. That's my Sunday school classroom. I'm praying about it the whole time. But I, mm -hmm. that does make my stomach hurt to think of any of them being yeah. outside of the church. Yeah, same, same, same. Well, now I want you to picture... You got, you got five. Picture mm -hmm. three of those people. This really makes it real, y'all. Picture three of those young people dropping out of the church sometimes mm -hmm. forever. Can't do I it. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about my five, and I would be devastated, hurt. Yeah, I don't want to see it happen. So we hope yeah. you're wide awake now. We hope you are awake to the problem, again, let me repeat it, 66% of American young people who are active in church in their teen years drop out in their young adult years. Some might boomerang back, but some don't. Um, so I hope you're ready for a really challenging, but also hope-filled episode of Grounded, because that's what we do around here. Elizabeth Urbanowitz is here, and she says this, it is possible to raise kids who don't walk away from Jesus Laura Booz is also here. She's going to get help us get practical with that. It's lots of good news. You might want to take notes. How do we raise kids who don't walk away from the Lord? Mm -hmm. I am ready. Okay. Me too. Like, I'm rubbing my hands together. Got my because I got a little one. So <laughs> give it I to take me. Give notes, it to me. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but first, we've got some good news, and Always. I am ready to share it. All right. So, have you ever been to a prayer service that lasted an hour? How about one that lasted a day? Well, what about a prayer service that lasted 100 years? <laughs> okay, yes, it happened. I know you guys think I'm crazy, but just keep tracking with me, all right? It happened in Germany, and here's the backstory. We uh, just crossed the 295th anniversary of the Moravian Revival. All right. One morning in 1797, God's spirit moved powerfully in a little church and the people who were there could hardly describe what God was doing in their midst. Get this. They said that when they left the church, they hardly knew whether they belonged to the earth or had already gone to heaven. 
Now listen, that sounds like my kind of churching, okay? <laughs> well, two weeks later, because of that revival, they launched a 24-hour prayer ministry. And it started with 24 men and 24 women who committed to pray for one hour every day. Well, surprisingly, that group grew and grew and grew and soon the children were praying for an hour a day and they kept praying every hour of every day for 100 years. But guess what? There's more to this good news story. From that little praying village, more than 300 missionaries were sent out into the world. Now that's remarkable in itself because this this particular congregation, it never exceeded 300 people. So they were able to send out more missionaries to serve than they ever welcomed into their pews. And those missionaries went to the ends of the earth while that group of men and women and children who had experienced revival kept praying and praying and praying. Now, while this is good news, it's also not exactly breaking news, but we wanted to share it with you today. It's clear and it's a fact that young people are walking away from the church in droves. Um, it makes me like I get a little lump in my throat when I think about that. Um, now, we can respond to this in one of two ways. We can fret and we can throw our hands up and we can cross our fingers that the kids we love uh, will be among the 34 percent who stay in church. Or we can do about these. We can do the same thing like these people I just talked about. We can hit our knees and pray and keep praying and keep praying even for a hundred years if we have to. God's spirit can draw our kids to Jesus. Just like these children's hearts were stirred, God can do the same. And you know, we think that's some good news. Mm -hmm. We'll drop a link to this sweet story um, just in case you want to check it out and share it. Oh, Aaron. man, I love that story, Portia. Here's a little known fact about Aaron Davis. I was once a high school history teacher. So you combined history, which I love, with church history, which I love, with hope, which I love. So that good news story did <laughs> great fill news. my take. Thank you. Yeah, great news. Well, time to get grounded with God's people. Elizabeth Urbanowitz, she was a teacher, too. She was serving as an elementary teacher at a Christian school, and she had an epiphany. And I'm so glad that she did, because out of that, she became the founder of a ministry called Foundation Worldview. I'm going to say it again, because moms, grandmas, neighbors, anybody who loves kids, this is an organization that I need you to have on your radar screen, Foundation Worldview. Because now what Elizabeth does is she teaches parents like me how to raise kids who don't walk away from Jesus. So uh, I'm excited for this conversation. Welcome to Grounded, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you so much for having me on today, Erin. Love your lamp behind you, by the way. Uh, Grounded is a diverse audience. So many are moms, but many are not moms. There are some who are watching who are empty nesters. There are some women who um, just never got married or had kids. Some women who are too young to even be starting a family yet. So before we go down this trail, uh, I want you to answer this question for me. Why is the fact that so many young people are walking away from the church? Why is that everybody's concern this morning? Well, because we have been called into the body of Christ, you know, and Jesus mm -hmm. makes clear in the New Testament, you know, from the way that he cares for his mom, that biological family is important. But he also makes clear, you know, when his mother and brothers come to him and, and he says, who are my mother and my brothers? You know, those who do the will of my father are my mother and my brothers, that Jesus makes clear that the ties that bind us most closely are not those actually of physical blood, but those of the blood of the lamb. And so we are a body of Christ. And so we are responsible for all of the children that God has placed in our care, whether those are our own biological children or adoptive children or foster children or grandchildren or nieces, nephews, or just those within the body of Christ. Those are our responsibility. Mm -hmm. I love that. I always thought if I was Jesus's mama and I heard him say that, I would have been like, I am your mama boy. But Jesus is making <laughs> an important point, right? That I love that. I hope the kids in my church see me moving towards them, wrapping my arms around them, loving mm -hmm. on them, 
even if they aren't my biological boys. Well, tell us the story. You were re- you were teaching at a Christian school and you had a realization about your students. What was that realization? The realization is that even though they came from wonderful Bible-based Christian homes, I was giving them a biblically-based education all day long. They were fairly involved in a local body of Christ. They were still rapidly absorbing ideas from culture. And what Mm -hmm. I realized is that, you know, the word of God is very clear that God is unchanging, you know, praise God that he is unchanging. His word is unchanging. It remains true forever. But what is changing is culture. And, you know, the kids that God has placed in our care Today, because of the prevalence of screens and the internet, which is not always a bad thing, but because of the prevalence of those things, in one year of their life, they will be faced with more competing ideas than most people throughout human history have been faced with in their entire lives. And so the prep work that we need to do to help to equip them to understand that God's word consistently lines up with reality, you know, it is the true worldview. The work that we have to do to help them understand that is different than the work we had to do to show that to kids, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So we have to understand how the unchanging truth of God's word can be shown as unchanging in this ever-changing culture. And that's good stuff. I've had a paradigm shift in my own parenting. A couple of years ago, it was Pride Month. And I, even as few as five years ago, that was something I could just keep out of my kids' line of sight if I worked hard at it. Now it's not. I mean, it's everywhere. No matter how hard I work, I can't deflect all of those messages. So I've had to realize, yes, I do some sheltering of my kids as as is age appropriate, but I have had to shift gears into this equipping that you're talking about. And frankly, it's more effective. It works. Um, So give us the basics. I think we as Christians, we use that word worldview, but I'm not sure we necessarily know what it means. What is worldview education and why do we need it? Yes, and I love that you asked that question because I think sometimes words such as worldview can just become buzzwords that become meaningless. And so when I say the word worldview and I explain it to kids this way, that a worldview is kind of like a mental map of what we believe Mm. is true about life and the world around us. It affects the thoughts we think, the words we say. The things we do. Yeah, just just to have that understanding of that. And so when we think of the biblical worldview, what we're talking about is not just one or two isolated verses, but we're talking about, okay, when we look at a topic that any worldview has to answer, how does the Bible as a whole answer this question? Like, for example, one Mm. of the main topics, you know, worldview topics that's front and centered, as you just mentioned, is what does it mean to be human? You know, so as we look at the biblical narrative as a whole, what does it teach about humanity? You know, the first chapters of Genesis teach us that we are created in God's image, that a part of being made in God's image is being made distinctly male or distinctly female. And then, you know, we're told our job that we are to steward creation, that we're to rule and to reign over God's creation here on earth. But we don't do that perfectly. Why? Because of Genesis 3, because of the fall. And then we look throughout the whole biblical narrative and we see that God has this grand plan to redeem us, that we're constantly going to be fighting against our flesh because we're born with a sin nature and we choose to sin every day. But God had this grand plan to redeem us by sending his son. And once we are reconciled in our relationship to God, you know, then we are freed to love God through doing good works, through living as we're supposed to. And so when we think of how the entire biblical narrative speaks to humanity, that's just one example. So when we talk about a biblical worldview, we're talking about all the big questions like who is God? What is truth? How did life begin? What does it mean to be human? How can I tell right from wrong? You know, what is real? How do I know things? How does the Bible answer those questions as a whole? I love that. I wasn't timing you, but that didn't take you long to walk through that really important (laughs) piece of our worldview, which is that identity piece. And we've talked Mm -hmm. some about this before on grounded catechizing our kids, which is an old fashioned word, but it's just, I think it's just intentionality. It's just, I'm going to control the messages, not control. That's not the root. I want to uh, steer the messages my children are hearing um, instead of just feeling like a victim, like, oh my goodness, the culture is so far gone. What can I do? Parenting is so hard. Um, It's realizing, yep, they're my kids. God's given them to me to steward. And I have a responsibility here. I want to hear about your own family because it seems like you grew up in a Christian home and didn't have that breakaway period. I hope that's right. What were some of the ways your Christians, your parents really sowed that Christian worldview into you when you were growing up? 
Yes, in so many ways. Um, actually, my sister and my brother and I talk about this frequently because we're, you know, one of the few families that we know of where, you know, all the kids in our family are faithfully seeking and serving Jesus. And I am not currently married, but Huge. my brother and my sister are, um, you know, and they are, they're married to believers and they're raising their kids in Christian homes. And so our parents did so many things, but they prioritized the right things. You know, they prioritized God and his word above all else, that we knew that God's word was the highest authority that my parents prioritize the relationship with God above all else. And after that, they got the rest of the priorities right as well. You know, they prioritize their marriage that we always knew as kids that we were loved, but we weren't the center of the universe. And the reason for that, mm -hmm. you know, is not because they were so madly in love with one another, you know, which they do love one another deeply, but it was because sure. they knew that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. And if they were not investing in their marriage, they were not portraying that picture, you know, that Paul talks about in Ephesians 5 of Christ. Christ and the church. You know, they they also were intentional about making sure that we were involved in the local body of Christ. I think especially for those who are watching and listening from the United States, we tend to have a very individualistic mindset of, you know, like it's me and my family and Jesus and we can do this. And the family is mm -hmm. important. You know, it's the basic building block of society. But Scripture is very clear, you know, that we're not independent of one another in Christ because we have Amen. union with Christ. And so therefore we're united with one another in a very real way. And so my parents, you know, they just lived in a way where we just always knew that spiritual family was family because they practice biblical hospitality. And I think that that's, you know, something that's so key in this very individualistic age. Um, and it also, you know, it really showed us the importance of the church, which, you know, again, you mentioned Pride Month before. And when we think about, you know, so many um, people in our culture who are claiming alternate identities, you know, that are not true identities, but even sometimes people within the church, you know, might struggle with same sex attraction or feeling like, you know, their biological sex doesn't match their inner feelings. And when, yeah. you know, if we're just like sectioned off in little isolated family groups, you know, people that experience those things are very much marginalized, where if we're living as the right. family of God, you know, they're welcome. Everyone is welcomed in. So those are two of the things that I think my parents did just very, very well, prioritizing the right things, you know, God and his word above all they, you know, their marriage came before us as kids, which actually benefited us in so many ways <laughs> as mm. kids, you know, and then really making sure that we were actively involved in the local body of Christ and knowing like this is our family. And when we do that, you know, we're giving our kids a true taste of eternity because we're yeah. going to be, you know, with Jesus and united with one another for the rest of eternity. And so I think those were just, you know, two things that I'm so very grateful that my parents did in our home growing up. I love that. There, it, there, And there is a gravitational pull against that. Um, my oldest are teenagers, mm -hmm. so I'm starting to experience the gravitational pull of activities, of sports, of other kinds of things we can do with our weekend. But we just have drawn a line ourselves. Nope. Sunday we go to church. If that means we have to miss a basketball game, if we have to sit on the bench because we missed a practice, then that's okay. That's the choice we've made. Um, and it, ha it hasn't always come easily. It hasn't always been well received by my boys. Um, but that's just a line that we're just not going to cross. And I can see that church membership, church attendance, being a part of a church family is already bearing fruit in their little hearts. So Jesus called us to be in the world, but not of it. I'm not sure we have any idea what that looks like. What do you think that looks like practically we can't just pull our kids out and put them in a little bubble as much as we might like to um they are in the world but they're supposed to be set apart what's that look like practically in say uh, an elementary school age kids life yes and i think the temptation for for parents or for anybody you know raising children within the body of christ the temptation is one of two things either to shelter them you know as you said like so much so that we're putting them in a bubble and we're never exposing them to anything that, you know, is not of God, which although we'd love to do that, that really leaves our kids very vulnerable. And then the other temptation mm -hmm. is to say, well, you know, like we'll just throw them in the deep end and they'll eventually learn how to swim and we'll see how it goes, you know, and that's, yeah. that leaves them vulnerable on both ends of the spectrum. And so I would argue that the, the biblical view is very much in the middle of those two things that yes, we are called to protect our children from certain things. You know, there are certain things that they're just not, you know, they, they shouldn't be bearing at a young 
age. However, if Mm. we want to prepare them to faithfully follow Jesus in a secular culture and be a witness for him, you know, be a light for him, they're actually, you know, entering into God's mission of reconciling the world to himself. We need to make sure that we're exposing them to the ideas of the world so that one, those ideas do not become tempting for them, that they're not just, you know, mysterious Mm. and, oh, what's this? I've never heard of it. You know, and then two, that they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're not, um, you know, just confused when they hear them. Mm. And so I always like to give the example of hand sanitizer that when I first started teaching, I got very sick my first year, like every first year teacher does all the germs. And then your second year yep. of teaching. <laughs> yes. Yes. Your second year of teaching, you're supposed to get sick a little bit less. Third year is supposed to be like third year's the charm. You know, you, you're immune to yeah. everything. Well, my third year, I got sick so often. I was on oh, eight no. rounds of antibiotics before Christmas break. And so I went to the doctor and I said, okay, I need some help. Like something is wrong. <laughs> like, and so he yeah. started asking me questions. And he said, how often do you wash your hands? And I said, well, I teach in a mobile classroom. I don't have a sink. So I use hand sanitizer. And he said, how many times? I was like, probably like 50 plus times, like I'm a germaphobe. Mm -hmm. And he was like, ding, 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 ding. Like, here's the problem. He said, you know, washing your hands before you eat is a good thing. He said, but when you use hand sanitizer all the time, he said, you're not only killing the germs. He said, you're killing the good bacteria on your hands. He said, and you're not allowing your body to get exposed to these viruses and bacteria in very small dosages. So then when you are exposed Mm -hmm. to them, your immune system, you know, you have no immunity. And then I stopped using hand sanitizer, just washed my hands before I ate. And I didn't get enough their sinus infection for five years. And I think it's the same way. Yes, I think it's the same way with our kids that when they're still within the safety of our homes and our schools and our churches, if we can expose them in very small dosages to the ideas of the world and give them the skills that they need to carefully evaluate those ideas, then they're going to be prepared when they see them in the world. And actually, when I started teaching the students in my classroom, you know, just to recognize faulty ideas, you know, like follow your heart, you know, and we would actually talk through Mm -hmm. like, okay, so let's talk about that. What might happen? if we followed our hearts, like one of the boys in my classroom raised his hand. He was like, Miss Urbano, it's, I'm super confused. Like, what if my dad's heart tells him I don't need any new toys, but my heart tells me I need a new video game. <laughs> What's going to happen? I said, yeah. oh, so you mean our hearts are going to tell us different things? And then it was so fun because once I started something. teaching my students these alternate worldviews, just in small dosages, every time we'd do silent reading, there would be a line of students at my desk to come up and show mm. me these false worldview ideas that they had found in mm. books. And, you know, over the weekend after they came in on Monday, they're like, oh my goodness, Miss you. I saw this other worldview in this movie. And so it was so exciting to see, expose them in small dosages and they're ready to understand yep. the truth of the Christian worldview. <laughs> I love it. I think the first time I had to defend my faith at all was at a sophomore level philosophy class in college. And I literally mm-hmm. shook. I, I had never had to stand up to an alternate worldview. Um, and I, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't do it well. and um, But I did do it. But my children now who are in middle school, they're having those conversations. We're doing that coaching in the car. It's a, like Deuteronomy 6 tells us it's a constant conversation. Um, and I, I've seen the Lord produce fruit. Well, Elizabeth, I could talk to you for hours. I wish that you could just be my personal parenting coach. I take you out to lunch once a week. But uh, when you think of the future of the church, the numbers are scary. But what? where's your hope for the future of the church? Well, my hope is where I think the hope of every Christian lies in Jesus Christ, <laughs> that he's unchanging and he's always in the business of saving, um, of saving people in every generation. But I think one thing that I think is so encouraging when you even think about, you know, this this podcast that we're doing, there are people watching and listening, showing that they love Jesus and they Mm. care about the next generation. And so I get so encouraged when I see women and men who are intentional about saying, you know what, I'm going to live my life to faithfully follow Jesus. And I want to do everything that I can so that the next generation will know the truth and the goodness and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. And you know what? I'm not responsible for a hundred percent of the kids in church right now. I'm responsible for my four. Um, And if the Lord were to woo and win the hearts of those four and they were to faithfully follow him all their lives, that would be such a victory for me. So the problem can be big, but I think we can think small. Tell us a little bit more about Foundation Worldview as we say goodbye. What's that organization doing right now? Yes. our, Our goal is to equip 
parents and ministry leaders and Christian educators with the tools that they need to get kids thinking critically and understanding the truth of the biblical worldview. So we do that in a variety of ways. The main way that we do that is we create curriculum. Um, we have comparative worldview curriculums. We have careful thinking curriculums. We have basic Bible study hermeneutics curriculums for kids. And so we do them all through videos. So we do all the teaching for you. So as long as you know how to press print and play, you are equipped to teach the kids in your care how to think well and how to think biblically. Um, we also host webinars. We have podcasts and blogs, just trying to equip in any way that we can those working with children to get them to understand the truth of the biblical worldview. Okay, I'm going to send it to our children's pastor at church. It's coming for you. Uh, and I want you to tell the people you know about it. We can all hit print and play. I love that. So I'm going to, we're going to drop the link so you can find out more about Elizabeth and Foundation Worldview. Thanks again for being on, Elizabeth. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Erin. We'll have you back. Before you start studying up on apologetics or, and, or changing the conversation you have with your kids, there's another step that we all need to take first. I want you to watch this short clip. And afterwards, Laura Booz is going to be with us. She's going to help us get grounded in God's word. So don't go anywhere. Watch this clip. Prayer really is the most important thing that a mom and a grandma, anyone in the kingdom of God can do because God himself says it's important and Jesus proves it's important by continuing to pray for us as he is in heaven. 24 seven he's praying for us and he wants us to join him in prayer so that we can release God's mighty right hand in the things that we pray for. for prayer grows as we grow in our relationship with the Lord. And I was so grateful that I was uh, raised in a Christian home uh, where my mom modeled prayer. She uh, had us kneel by our beds uh, before we went to bed at night. We prayed before every meal. There would be times before we left the driveway that she would pray for protection. What she was saying to this little girl at that time was, there is a living God who hears our prayers, who cares about every single thing in our life. And I believed that because it was modeled in such an uh, a way that uh, the reality of Christ's presence was, was, was real in our family because of my mom. One of the hardest things for especially a mom uh, to continue in fervent prayer for her child when she sees no answer to prayer, or seemingly no answer to prayer. We've got to trust our Heavenly Father knowing that when we pray according to His will, according to His Word, that He is at work even though we do not see it. And that's why Jesus uh, reminds us so beautifully in Luke 18, 1, he says, don't get faint hearted, you know, don't stop praying. He wants to encourage us that I am at work. I will release uh, my will and my timing and my way. And you know what's interesting about that too is I think that God keeps us in the waiting room, if I could say it that way, because he wants to do some sweet things in the mom's heart, in the grandma's heart. He so desires to have his will done on earth as it is in heaven, but his bride needs to pray. Well, another gift that God gives us for our children's sake is singing. Singing God's word is powerful and it will bless you in the moment and then the song will return to you just when you need it most. I could tell you about the incredible science of how God's design of music is the perfect mechanism for the human brain to process complex ideas, to remember, to meditate, to emote, even to feel unity with the people you're singing with. I could tell you that although a person may forget their own child's name, they will remember songs from the past. 
And I could list verses encouraging us to sing to the Lord and to speak to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. But this morning, I want to tell you a story about how one song of scripture sustained me. Well, I was a young mom with two little girls and I was pregnant with our third child. So as you can imagine, I had mom brain. <laughs> I was tired and I didn't have time to focus on Bible study. I never got through an entire church sermon. And I wondered if I was even discipling my own little girls effectively. But one thing I could do when the children were playing or when we were driving in the car, I could turn on these little scripture songs that we loved. It's just music written with word for word verses from the Bible. And sometimes we would just listen, but often because they were so easy to sing, we would sing along. And then of course the songs would get stuck in our heads and there I'd be awake in the middle of the night. Best song ever running through my mind. Now these songs were great for my children. I loved hearing them sing along, but they were also a feast for me. They, in the moment, reminded me of God's character and his promises, of his law and his grace, of his will for my life and how he wanted me to treat other people. So when I was short on time and short on energy and attention, those little scripture songs were a feast to me. And one time, one of the scripture songs ministered to me in a very dark season. It was at our 20-week ultrasound appointment when we discovered that our third little baby had died. And in that moment that I heard the news, so many thoughts and emotions flooded my mind. Shock and devastation, but there was one thought that was louder than all the others. And it was the song of Psalm 92:15 that I had sung in the kitchen with my little girls. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. That song just stuck in my head and it continued playing through my mind from the moment that I heard that terrible news, through labor and delivery, through grieving and mourning, through weeks and weeks of readjusting life to life without Juliet. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Oh, how I needed those words. I was in the middle of one of the most intense storms of my life with big questions, big doubts, big sorrows, tossed and blown, the waves arching high, and that simple melody thrummed the truth through my mind. God is my rock, there for the clinging to, there is a place to get grasp for air, there to heave my sorrows upon. I could throw my full weight on him and he would bear it. He would not slip away in the night and leave me to perish. And the song reminded me that God is righteous. Though stillbirth felt so evil, so unrighteous, I clung to the truth that there is no unrighteousness in God. This helped me to see that Juliet did not die because God had a lapse in judgment. She didn't die because he was cruel or vindictive. God doesn't play games with our lives. He doesn't operate on superstition. He doesn't change. Instead, he is fettered by his own goodness and fully satisfied by Christ's death on the cross. He will never allow harm to befall me or my family unless he plans to redeem it for a good so glorious as to render past sorrows obsolete. And nothing, not even this tragedy, can snatch me from his hand. From that experience, I learned the power of singing his word. Oh, how it was good in the moment, in the kitchen, when the sun was shining and we were dancing around, and how it came to minister to me when I needed it most. You know, I cannot anticipate how God's true, inerrant word set to music, maybe through a sophisticated sweeping melody or a silly little children's tune, will nurture and sustain my children today and in the future, but I am confident that it will. And I know that his word and his song will sustain you and the young people that you love. So sing scripture, sing it to the Lord, sing it about the Lord in the middle of the night, sing it to your children, sing it with your children. And remember, you are held in the very capable hands of a heavenly father who assures us of his love through singing. I'm going to leave you with the verses from Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. 
Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Back to you, Portia. Amen. Amen. So the entire time I caught a glimpse of myself on the camera and I've been just over here smiling the entire time because I have been so encouraged um, by everything that you taught us. And I can't wait to sing with my Emmy. So thank you, Laura. Oh, you're so welcome, Portia. <laughs> well, before we send you into your week, we always want to equip you. And in case you didn't know, today is September 12th. That means that True Woman 22 starts in 10 days. Woohoo! <laughs> Well, we hope many of you are already registered. And if you're in Indianapolis, please be sure to come hug our necks and say hello. Or if you're watching on the live stream, get in that chat and say hi. Let us know you're a grounded sister. One thing you may not realize is that there is a special team track. Um, kind of like a conference within a conference just for your daughter or your granddaughter. And she's going to be sitting under solid Bible teaching from Dana and Aaron and others like Kelly Needham and Stacy Rudolph. And so we want to help your girl or girls get grounded in God's word. And so there's still space. You can still register today. Maybe you can surprise her with a last minute godly girls weekend. We'll drop a link for you to register there i hope that your girls are going to be there i can't wait to point your daughters your granddaughters to jesus that's my mm -hmm. highest privilege i love mm -hmm. laura's message for us um i was thinking of two tools that i use with my own boys that you might just mm -hmm. want to grab onto practically one is called songs for saplings if you can get the music on your itunes or you can get the cds i actually have a cd player in my car so that's what we use they're on mm -hmm. youtube and that's what she was talking about those songs that are straight straight Scripture. So we pray mm -hmm. song, play songs for saplings most mornings at my house. Um, but I've also recently been, been introduced to Seeds Family Worship. And my family is currently listening to Seeds Family Worship. And I think it's Proverbs 4, my voice could tell you. It's the mm -hmm. trust in the Lord with all your heart verse. And so she's on to something uh, as you go, as you drive to school, as you drive to church, as you drive to the grocery store. A lot of those conversations can happen in the car. So there's a couple of practical things to hold on to. Portia, there's a lot going on in the chat, um, and I don't want to skip past this moment. There seems to be a couple of threads. One is mamas who can look back on the years when they were raising their kids with some regret. They did their best. I think every mom is doing their best. Even if we're mm -hmm. failing miserably, we're, we're often doing our best. But mm -hmm. they can look back with regret. And so I want to acknowledge you, mamas, as you're hearing this episode yes. and going, oh, I wish that I had been more intentional in discipleship. The other is moms who um, have seen their children's walk away. And Roshanda, if you don't mind, I'm going to have you be our poster child for this. This grabs my heart. Roshanda said, we raised our kids in prayer, grace, and love. We had the family meetings. We homeschooled. We had the family devotional. We had the hard talks. And three out of four of my children have walked away from the church. I am in the waiting room of hope. When I entered, there was despair, but I know God hears me. I know he loves my children more than I could ever. So I trust him. And then she said, heaven rules. So um, mama, whether you're feeling the guilt or you're in the waiting room, or maybe you can praise God that your children are walking with the Lord. Um, I just want us to pray together. So imagine moms, grandmas, women all around the world right now, if we could hold hands, I would sure love that. Um, joining together and praying for the next generation. Let me pray for us. Jesus, your word says you're faithful from generation to generation. So the generation of children and young adults that we love and know right now, it's your intention that they would know your love that they would surrender their lives to you, that they would walk out the blueprint you give us in scripture. But our natures are broken. We all run uh, like sheep who have gone astray away from you. And I pray for the children 
and young adults represented by the women hearing my voice right now. How many could that be? Is it tens of thousands? Is it hundreds of thousands? Is it millions? Only you know, God. But I pray that you would do something supernatural in their lives. I'm going to pray boldly that all of the children and young adults represented by the women hearing my voice right now would live faithful lives to you. That all of the children and young adults would surrender or resurrender themselves to you. That all of the children and young adults would be come a part of the body of Christ, be active in church, God. We can't do that. Even our best efforts, as Roshanda shared, aren't enough to change our children's hearts forever. But you can do it. So I pray that you will. I pray for any woman listening to this who's feeling um, attacked by guilt or shame right now. I pray that you would take those off of her and show her a way she can respond that is rooted in what you want for her life. It's in your holy, holy, holy name I pray. Amen. 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 You know, I'm reminded that there is hope. I am mm. the poster child for hope. Um, you are. I had wayward years. Like, you probably would have thought that I was not going to come back from that. And the mm. Lord brought me back. So for uh. any mama who is watching right now, know that there is hope for your baby. P, did your mama keep praying during those wayward years? I think I Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And we're still praying now. I have a younger sister and you know some of what we've been dealing with. And right. yeah, we're still praying. We're still praying. Yeah. So there, there's praying, hope. praying, moms. Yep. <laughs> well, the next episode is going to be a good one. We have Karen Ellis who will be joining us next mm. week. She's going to be talking about persecution, perseverance, and the key to sustaining faith. You don't want to miss it. I'll so be there. Let's, yep, be there. <laughs> Beat me there, okay? All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's wake up with hope together next week. We're grounded.